an extension of your undergraduate uh, uh, digital signal processing where we talk about uh, two-dimensional signal processing or in the general terms, multi-dimensional signal processing. And uh, what we'd like to do, uh, our plans is to really learn the basic representation of two-dimensional signals, uh, look at some uh, of the really uh, most common uh, two-dimensional signals and function. And then in your undergrad, you studied a linear time invariant system, LTI systems. Uh, and here we don't really have time, but we have space. Uh, so we will study uh, LSI, a linear uh, spatial uh, invariant system. Uh, so LSI, you can think of it as an LTI, but uh, instead of any time, we have a two dimension space um, in a state. And then uh, we will look at uh, the two dimension convolution. And then next uh, Tuesday, next week, we'll study uh, more detail after that. So uh, this is the outline uh, of uh, the lecture between today and uh, next lecture. Uh, the image representation, signal systems, and convolution. Uh, hopefully, we can finish those in the next one hour. And then next Tuesday, we can talk about support extension, uh, arithmetics, and two-dimensional frequency response for Fourier transform. Um, and then we can work start with sampling after that. Okay, an image representation. Um, uh, there are three common ways uh, how we represent images or two-dimensional signals. Uh, one is really an, a matrix uh, where you have columns, uh, an array of columns, and then you have two-dimensional field of impulses and a multi-dimensional random field. So this, the, the first representation, is really an array of columns, and you can see in here, this is the first column, second column, and so on. And um, this is how uh, we really program how we code in Python and MATLAB uh, our uh, our our natural images. Um, the second one, which we'll be using for the next um, few uh, topics and lectures, as I mentioned before, uh, the whole course is divided into five kind of modules. Uh, the, in the first module, uh, this is the representation we will be using. This is a generalization, uh, a two-dimensional signal uh, where we have uh, the x-axis as the index m, the y-axis is the index n. And then there is a support region. In this case, this is the support region for the image. And the image is of size n1 and N2. So by definition, at every discrete region or index in here, which is defined by the variable M minus K and N minus L. So keep in mind, this is M and N. These are the variables that really define where we are in this two dimensional signal or image. And then K and L are the variables for the summation. As we shift, by K and or L, uh, then we have different uh, values. These values are defined by this number. So F of K and L is a scalar, um, is, a, is a number, is a coefficient, uh, and that coefficient can vary with uh, location of K and L throughout this image. Uh, so the uh, most uh, common one, if you look at the unit sample function, all of these F of K and L will be equal to a one, so what we will have just a field of impulses and how many of those do we have? We have N, uh, N1 times N, N2. Uh, so this is kind of the common, the, the, the representation we will be using uh, for the first part of the course. And then um, the other uh, representation is to look at an image as a multi-dimensional random field where every single pixel is a random variable um, and then we have it's, uh, the, the old statistical analysis um, that can be applied. Uh, we will touch base on this representation. We'll not really go through this representation in more detail, except when we talk about denoising. Uh, in one of the topics in denoising, we will touch base uh, on this representation. Other than that, we will not um, we will not use this representation other topics other than denoising or subtopics in denoising. 
So let's look at some of the most common two-dimensional signals. So uh, in general, um, when we have a, a definition of a two-dimensional discrete signal, we say f is defined as f of m and n, where m and n, both of them are defined between negative infinity and infinity. Since this is a discrete signal, then we are looking at m and n as indices, and they are integers, right? So for now, uh, we are not only limiting ourselves to natural images that we can really take from a camera. We can uh, make an assumption that f can be a real, can be complex, or some kind of a vector uh, if it's be more than uh, just um, an intensity value. So it can be really uh, a color uh, image in this case. So this is kind of a generalization of what a two-dimensional signal could be. So the most common uh, one we will be studying is uh, a unit sample. And we, maybe you are familiar with the definition of delta of n um, from undergrad. This is one when n is equal to a zero and zero otherwise. So this is the same uh, extension. The only difference in here, we are really extending this into two dimension. We have m and we have n, so m and n. And again, it's equal to a one when both m and n are both are zeros and zero otherwise. And you can see the representation here with this dark uh, black disk at the center that represents um, a non-zero sample, which is one in this case, and then it will be zero everywhere else. Uh, and that's really our unit sample. Uh, it's just a one pixel image uh, located at the origin. And we can extend that into a certain direction to get uh, what we refer to as a two-dimensional line input. Uh, so this is really a sequence that is uniform in one direction and impulsive in the other direction. And um, you recall this definition from uh, the undergrad where you have delta of n is equal to one at n equal to zero, a single sample. We have the x-axis as n, uh, this is n, and then at Is in, and then basically by defining it around here. So now um, this is our delta of n. Now we are extending that, and now we are saying if you can really have a uh, second dimension m, then we can really bring this second index. Now, what does it really mean to have delta of n? What does it mean in this two dimension space to have delta of n plus n? What does it mean to have delta of n? What does it mean to have delta of m minus n? So we go from a one-dimension impulse sequence to a line of impulses. So basically, we are taking that one line here, and then we are extending it into the perpendicular direction, as we'll show you in this uh, slide. So in here, what this means, that f of m and n equal to delta of m, that means it's really equal to a 1 when m is equal to a 0, and it will be 0 otherwise. So in this case, uh, in this two-dimensional space, we have m. This is the origin when we have m is equal to a zero, and it doesn't really matter what the value of m. It doesn't, so it's equal to a one when m equal to a zero and for all values of m. So it's a vertical line, as you can see from this drawing in here. Uh, and that's delta of n. On the other hand, if you look at delta of n, delta of n means this is equal to a one when m equal to a zero. So basically that will be, this is the axis M, this is when it's equal to a zero, so this will be a horizontal line. Um, so it's one when N equal to a zero, and zero when N is not equal to a zero, and doesn't really matter for values of M. So that will give us really um, a horizontal line as in this case. The third example is delta of M plus N, and in this case, this will be equal to a one, when really M, plus n is equal to a zero and zero otherwise. So when does m plus n equal to a zero? When they are really equal in magnitude different in uh, sign. So when m is zero and n equal to a zero, we have a zero, uh, we have a one. When m is one and n is negative one, we have a one. When m is negative one and n is positive one, we have a one and so on. So we have this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, line uh, crossing the origin with uh, slope of 45, negative 45 degrees in this case. 
And then similarly, you can be extend this example. This would be equal to a one when our two M minus N is equal to a zero, it will be zero otherwise. And you can really draw this line here and you can see this is the line that we have with this uh, positive slope in this case. So we have this kind of a line of impulses to define uh, the extension of the, uh, the, the unit uh, sample from the 1D case to a two-dimensional case, because it will be, uh, let me see if I can. Oops. Oh, okay. Okay. And then we have the two-dimensional uh, unit the function. Uh, and remember, by definition, we had a U of N in the one-dimensional case. U of N is equal to a one whenever N is larger than or equal to a zero and zero otherwise, right? So if you remember, we had, this is N. So we start from here. And this is our U of N, where this is one, two, three, and so on to infinity. So that's U of N. So this is just a, a two dimensional extension of that definition where U of M and N is equal to a one when M is larger than or equal to a zero and N is larger than or equal to a zero. So you can get this disk in here. Um, and this goes to infinity in all directions in this case. Um, okay. So, uh, this is a two-dimensional uh, unit step uh, function. And then another special function uh, that uh, is really important in cases when we have texture or certain patterns that are governed by uh, a certain um, periodicity matrix. So in this case, uh, this is a two-dimensional periodic sequence. If you study this, um, we have the x-axis m, we have n, and you can see uh, we have this pattern, right? We have this pattern here, which is four by three. And this pattern is the same values, everything the same pattern, keep repeating, right? And so we have this kind of periodicity in here, right? So now this periodicity is governed by uh, two vectors. The first vector is indicated here. So this vector in here is moving from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is seven. And then uh, the, the y-axis, this is two. So there is a, this vector in here is seven in the n direction and two in the n direction. And the second one is this vector in here. So it is in the n direction is negative two. And the n direction is one, two, three, four, this way. And so we have two, these two vectors to define periodicity in the, in the two-dimensional space. In the one-dimensional case in the, in the grad, if you remember, uh, we had the periodicity capital T defining a periodicity uh, which is just single number. So in this case, we are going to the two-dimensional case. So we need two by two. So we need two-dimensional, uh, two two-dimensional vectors to define our periodicity in the two-dimensional uh, case. So we can look at this in more detail. So if you look at um, any number in this cluster, in here, we refer to it as f of m and n. If you move by seven and two, and then you get the same numbers, right? Now, if you move by negative two and four, you get the same numbers, right? Because you are incrementing with the same values for m and n. So now, um, notation-wise, what we are really interested in, in defining basically what is the f, using this notation where we have a vector, what, and then n in here is m and n. So we'd like to really have this notation defining what uh, we are uh, looking at. So if you look carefully at this notation here, this is nothing but f tilde. I have m and n plus, we have a two by two matrix multiplied by our R1 and R2. So now, this M and N are variables. This matrix in here, two by two matrix, it used to be 
a one number capital T in the one dimensional case. In here, this is a two by two. We refer to this as a periodicity vector. And then we have R1 and R2. These are integers to scale, to tell us basically, am I at this copy? 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 And so on. So which copy I am? So this is basically the purpose of these integers, R1 and R2. And we need two of them because that will scale both vectors in this case. So the periodicity matrix, um, the vector in here, the periodicity vectors in here are defined by uh, our periodicity as in the previous uh, slide. So we have seven and two, and we have negative two and four. Right? So now um, in the first integers pair for R1 and R2, if R1 and R2 are both zeros, then I am at this copy here, right? If, uh, oh, change. Okay, if R1 is equal to a one and R2 is equal to a zero, then I'm scaling, I'm here in this direction. If R1 is one and R2 is one, then I am at this one here, at this copy and so on. So you can see there are only six numbers uh, in here. Uh, so these are the four periodicity vectors. And then R1 and R2, that will really guide us to where we are in this space, which copy we are on in this case. I'll stop here to, if, there, if there's any question. Any questions from viewers? Okay. Uh, yeah, what's that, uh, what's the, uh, could you clarify that notation again? The um, uh, notation next to the N inside the orange box. Okay, so th let's look at this one here, okay? So this one here, I'm just trying to compact my notation. You can replace this equation with this one here. So I'm just looking at the indices M and N as a vector in here. So this is really a generalization of so I could write f of m and n, right? Or I just want to say this is equal to, I just want to have m, n, and then I have 7, 2, negative 2, and 4, and then I have my r1, r2. This is only a two-dimensional basically vector. This is the notation. I'm just compacting. It's nothing really... Instead of really being lazy to write M and N, I'm just writing really N as a vector, but the N vector is only M and N. Um, so if you look at this notation here, let me just clear this up a little bit. So if you look here, this is M and N. This is M and N. This is here the two by two matrix. This is R1. So now the periodicity in the M direction the way I calculate it is that I have M seven two negative two and four R one R two. So um, oh sorry, this is uh, this is summation here. This is sum here. Yes. Um, so now I multiply this. So this would be equal to M N plus I have seven R one minus two R two, and then here I have two R one plus four R two, and then this will be equal to M plus two R one negative two R two, and then the second line will have N plus two R one plus four R two. Right. So now R1 and R2, uh, these are, will tell us which copy we are in. If there are zeros, then basically we are in the first copy here. If both of them are, if it's one, uh, R1 is equal to a one, R2 is equal to a zero, then all I'm shifting really N with uh, two times one and N by two. If R2 is equal to a one, R1 is equal to a zero, then I'm shifting M by M minus two times one, and then N by R times one, which is uh, N plus four. So it, 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 if you do it by hand or just do it in, uh, in MATLAB or Python, you can see basically which copy I am in that's controlled by R1 and R2. 
the periodicity itself is controlled by these numbers in here. This is seven, sorry, this is seven. Seven, two, negative two and four. I hope I answered the question. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, another concept I will use really heavily in convolution is separability. Uh, so the idea of separability is that a two-dimensional signal, in this specific case, we call it H of M and M, uh, if it is the product of two one-dimensional sequences. So in this case, F of M is uh, a one-dimensional sequence in the M direction, and the function of M, and G of N is a one-dimensional sequence as a function of N as in NASA. So if the product of these two will give us H of M and N, then we say our sequence or our signal H is separable, and that will become very handy, and you will see at the very end um, of the lecture today uh, how can that save quite a bit in our computational uh, calculations. So if you look at impulse responses, uh, it's filter basically impulse responses, uh, two-dimensional unit impulses, unit steps, vertical horizontal lines, all of these are separable. So uh, although we cannot really control and most of our images, natural images we are dealing with are uh, not separable, at least the filter uh, impulse responses we can design to be separable so we can really instead of having a two-dimensional convolution we can have a sequence of two consecutive one-dimensional convolution and we'll see how much saving in terms of computation that will give us in in in, in, uh, in a few minutes so that's really kind of the strength of uh, separability uh, in this case and then the other uh, uh, concept is this kind of a uh, Two-dimensional signals, uh, uh, and if you think about natural images, they have a finite extent, meaning that uh, they, they cannot, their indices in M and N direction, or N1 and N2 direction, they will not go for infinity. Uh, they are really uh, finite in, uh, in, 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 that, in that sense. Um, so um, which, that becomes important when you look at the convolution, when you really convolve a certain image uh, with uh, some filter, uh, then the output will have a dimension different from the input image. So what can we do uh, when that is uh, the case? And we'll look at some examples of those, most likely uh, next lecture. So let's look at two-dimensional uh, systems. And uh, this brings us to that concept um, of linear shift invariant systems, which is nothing but really an extension in the two-dimensional space uh, of the LTI, linear time invariant system. And um, uh, in, in the general case, you have an input, a two-dimensional image uh, or signal, f of m and n. You transform it, um, and you get an output g of m and n. Right? So um, it's the same concept that you have seen before. The only difference in here, we don't really have that time axis. What we have is uh, this the spatial space, the plane, two-dimensional plane, uh, where the image is, is located. So very basic uh, calculations, um, uh, like for example, addition, uh, you can really add, this is point by point addition. So F M and N plus G of M and N, uh, they are really point by point. You can scale uh, your image with some kind of a factor in here. And uh, what will happen in this case, if uh, it depends on, on saturation in your, uh, in your, your image, um, you have to be careful. And so, for example, um, if your scanner C in here will make all the values larger than 255 um, and without you being be careful about normalization beforehand, then uh, the output image G will be saturated, will be everything is white, right? So you lost all the information there. So, so scaling, basically, you have to be careful when you scale your image um, with such a, such a function. Um, and then uh, shifting, uh, basically shifting in the, uh, this is a very specific case where I have two by two dimension image, uh, two by two uh, signal. And then um, you shift in the horizontal case by, by one to the right, in the vertical by two to the top. So 
I'm doing one here and two uh, vertically. So that's basically K and L are our shift um, indices. And this has become very important because I can represent any image as I mentioned before, any two dimensional image as nothing but a decomposition of um, weighted and shifted two dimensional unit sample. So these are unit sample, they are shifted by K and M, and they are weighted by F of K and M. And that's um, an image decomposition representation that we, uh, we looked at a few months ago. And then this cropping. I mean, it's a, cropping is a function where uh, you have your signal, two dimensional signal F of M and M, and then you have a, you define a cropping function. Uh, and that cropping function C of M and M, uh, the difference between uh, this one uh, and uh, the finite extent, for example, definition is that uh, the C in here, uh, it, the value uh, depends uh, where you are in this in the space. Um, so if um, if that value is constant, then what you are doing is nothing but cropping because that means uh, if the constant value is one, then you are really doing purely cropping. Um, if you, the value is two or not different than one, but is the same everywhere uh, within C of M and N, then uh, what you are really doing cropping and scaling. Um, however, uh, if uh, the value C in here of this operator varies with space, that means varies with depending on the values of M and N, then uh, in this case, uh, you have an operator uh, that's really changing the values in the input signal F of M and N based on location. Um, and that becomes basically just a filter. So um, here are some just examples on the linear image. Uh, uh, and then, uh, so this is the linear image. You add it one by one operation with the cameraman, you get this image in here as obvious, you have a shift, you get this image in here. And I'll come back to this in a minute. And then you have a, you have a scalar multiplication, um, you get this image, and you can see the difference between this image and this image, that this one here is a little bit brighter uh, because you scale the image. So as if you are shifting um, the image to be on the closer to the upper uh, bracket, which is closer to the white, and light gray uh, regions uh, in the on the intensity uh, scale. So you are shifting everything to be closer to 255. So you have a brighter image in this case. Or you have a spatially varying gain. Uh, this is simply, uh, you can just have a random generator of a white Gaussian noise. And then you add, it basically it depends on the location of the pixels. So you generate a noisy image as in this case. Now back to this, um, Shift idea in here, and this comes of you know like uh, uh, it, it 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 all the students ask the question of um, what is my support region in this case? Uh, so do I need to shift my support region, or do I need to keep this basically uh, region to show that um, it's my finite support region or my lattice is fixed? And then if I shift the image, then hard luck basically I'm losing part of the image. So this dealing with this. Um, the boundaries, what we do, we usually we pad zeros. So we pad the image uh, with zeros beforehand. And this basically with the padding, depends on what operation we have, but just keep it as a practice, as an exercise all the time, pad with a certain number of zeros around the image. And now this new region is my finite support. Uh, if I'm shifting around, then I'm not really losing information from the image. If I'm convolving, if I am doing all these operations, I'm not really losing part of the image. And that's basically kind of, uh, I think uh, there is really no uh, correct or wrong uh, way to do it. Uh, it just basically you have to be careful as far as you are consistent throughout your codes or your, your homework um, with a spatial domain or space, uh, not time, and memoryness. Uh, so linearity uh, is really nothing but an extension of the linearity definition in the 1D case. Um, so, in, in, in plain English, a linear system is nothing but when you have a superposition of the inputs, you will produce a superposition of the output. Um, it doesn't really matter if you are dealing with one dimension or two dimensional uh, signals in this case. Um, so, if you have two dimensional, uh, two images of two two dimensional signals, F1 and F2, and we have two constants A and B then uh, the system that really operate 
uh, we call it T is linear if and only if if you scale F1 with A, scale F2 with B, add them together, apply your operator, is the same as operate on F1, operate on F2, scale with A in here, scale with B in here, add them together. So a superposition of these inputs, which is what we did in here, is the same as the superposition of the outputs, which is what we did in here. Right? So in that case, we have a linear, a linear system. And then the shift invariant is the same concept as time invariant. Uh, so uh, the, the, in plain English, a shift in the input sequence will produce the same shift in the output sequence. Meaning that if you have a system with an operator T, and when you operate on an input F, the output will be G. Now, if you shift the input F, and you operate on it with the same operator T, this will give you the same answer as if you shifted G with the same amount K and L. So in that case, what we have is a shift invariant system, the same concept as time invariant system. And here we call it LSI, because we are working in the spatial domain or in two dimensional space. So uh, what we had before as LTI, now we just call it LSI. But the same same concept, and then uh, finally um, the other uh, property in here is this uh, memory uh, in the spatial domain. Uh, usually, uh, we uh, like to operate on every single pixel independently of the other pixels, and here's an example of this operator. So this operator in here G, we can get the output G by squaring the pixel, every single pixel. Um, in the input image F. So in here, we are really operating on every single pixel by itself. We are not averaging, we are not doing a median filter, we are not doing a mean filter, we are not really looking uh, uh, any, uh, we are not taking into consideration the neighborhood, the neighboring pixels in calculating the output of, uh, our, uh, of our operator. So in this case, we say we have no memory uh, in here, the memory is always indication of time, but we are extending this to the spatial domain. So memory meaning that we are not looking at the neighbors, uh, neighboring pixels in this, in this case, which is really rarely happening uh, in, in processing because as we can see, and we, as, as we already know, uh, there is a very high correlation among neighboring pixels. Um, okay. So let's look at these two cases. Um, we have the first one, so the operator that you operate on F is nothing but we have F of F, M and N, and then you are multiplying it with another operator that can vary based on M and N. So we are not really limiting this to be equal to one or a cropping or a scalar, but it can vary based on the location M and N. And the question is, um, is this uh, system linear? Is this system shift invariant? So what do you think? Is this linear? Anybody? Why not? There's an answer in chat. You can you can turn on the audio. Uh, why is not linear? Feel free to turn on your audio, the microphone. Uh, if you choose to. So what is linearity? Uh, a superposition of two signals, right? We have, if you have F1 and F2, right? And then you multiply A times F1 plus B times F2, right? So that's our input, composition of these two, and then I'm operating on them. So what's the operator? Multiplying this whole thing with C, right? So now what do I have? I have A1, A times F1 times C plus B times F2 times C, right? So that's one output. Now, if I apply this by definition, if I apply this superposition at the output, so this side in here, 
we just erase this. So it's the same thing. What, I, what do I have? So what do I have in this case? I will have A times operator F1, which is what? A times C F1 plus B operating on F2. What is the operating in this specific example? Is B times C times F2. So what I will have in here is what? A F1 times C plus B times F2 times C, which is the same as what I will get from this side. So in this case, the left hand and the right hand side are equal. So in this case, we have what? We have a linear alternator. So in, the, in here, this system in here, it is linear. Yes, so there's an answer by Ryan. Uh, yes, exactly. So it is linear in this case. Um, any question about that? What about shift invariance? Is this shift invariant? What is shift invariance? Remember, this is our operators, C of M and N times F of M and N. Our shift invariance test is this one here. Let me erase these. The shift invariance is this thing here. Basically, I'm shifting the input operating. I get the same as if I shifted the output. So what is the input? The input is what? F, right? So now the If I shift the input, what do I have? I have the operator over F of M minus K, N minus L. What is this? It will be equal to C, uh, C of M and N times F of what? M minus K, N minus L. Right? So that's if I'm shifting the input. This will be the output. What if I want to look at the other test, which is the right-hand side of this thing in here? What if I shift the output? What is my output? My output is this thing in here. What is the shifting the output? That means I will have C of M minus K, N minus L, F of M minus K, N minus L. These two are not equal. Right? They are not the same. Why? Because our operator or our um, coefficient in here varies with time. That's why if I'm shifting it, again, remember, we are not limiting this to be, even if we limit this to be equal to one, a constant, it's still, um, it's a, it's a, it's a nonlinear, um, sorry, it's a shift, in, uh, shift not non-shift invariant operator. So in this case, this is not really a shift invariant uh, in, in this case. And thanks for those who said no uh, in, the, in the chat room. Okay, what about the second system? Is it linear? Yep, it's very obvious. We have the square in here, absolutely. It's not linear in this case because uh, a F1 plus B F2 will not give you the same as the output, which is A times G1 plus B times G2 because of the, the power two here. Is it shift invariant? So shifting the input is the same as shifting the output. In this case, yes, because when you shift the input, you have F of M minus K and M minus L will be the same as when you shift the output, which is F of M minus K, M minus L all to the power two. So this is shift, uh, shift invariant in this case. Uh, so uh, we can continue. Uh, here is in the image operations. You can really do these kind of uh, operations there. Uh, uh, and you can see basically with, uh, with different operations. Um, uh, I will not really do the demo in here. I'm using my eye. So let's look at uh, inside two dimension of convolution. We'll do some specific example at the end. Let's just introduce why we really, the LSI system or idea, it, it, um, it makes things easier to do this convolution. So uh, go back a little bit. Um, we have this decomposition. And if you remember, we have F, F of M, uh, F of M and M is basically you have these unit samples. They are shifted in the two dimensions case and they are weighted. And then you have basically a summation of all of these or, or a, a, a composition of all of these. 
So that's basically uh, our input image. So now if we have a, li a linear shift invariant system, uh, then our output of this system, which is G of M and N in here, will be equal to nothing but the sum of the shifted pixel responses. So you take every single uh, sample or pixel that you want to limit to this to the images. And then what we have is we have a shift and we have a scale, right? So you take the inputs and then you shift them and you scale them. And that becomes our uh, our output G of M and N, which is the same definition we had in the 1D uh, convolution when we talk about linear time invariant system. Just look at the decomposition because of the linearity and the shift invariance or time invariance properties of the system, then we can really write G of M and N in this case as uh, the sum of the weighted shifted input samples. And now if you notice in here, we change this H because that's basically the impulse response of the system. That basically meaning that if we have the system MSI and we can define it with this impulse response H of M and N, that means the output will be this. Uh, the definition, uh, if the input, uh, if, if H is delta, right, uh, then what we have at the output G will be nothing but double summation of our scalar. We can keep them as um, H of K and L or F of K and L, and then we have our delta of M minus K and minus L. But in here, while extending that, say, to any generalizable input F, not only delta, then basically my shift, my shifted and weights are governed by this H operator. Okay, so uh, that's basically it's it's uh, a, a straightforward uh, extension of the one-dimensional convolution when we had LTI system. Uh, you can call it even LTI uh, system in this case. Um, so. Uh, and n, it's defined over this between zero and m minus one, and on the vertical axis between zero and n minus one, it is zero outside. And so this is the finite extent here. And then we have our operator or our impulse response h of m and n is the unit sample function. So really it is u of m and n. So this is one in this quadrant. The first quadrant in here is one everywhere in our lattice. So what is the convolution between these two? Our so, if you remember, um, I'll just go through uh, the the rhythmic and the steps. Uh, and then the first thing we do, if you remember, um, we have let me write it down here: p of m and n equal double summation over k and l. And now you can say this is f of k and l multiplied with h of m minus k and n minus l. Or this is equal to double summation over k and l. But now you have h of k and l because of the linearity um, property of the system, we can do this uh, f of m minus k and n minus l. Right? So now either we, our weights are coming from f or our weights are coming from h. Either way uh, we'll do. So in this specific example, uh, what we are doing is with the first definition. Right, so we are doing with this definition here, which is the sub summation over k and l, f of k and l, and then uh, we have h of m minus k n minus l. So now, what? So let me erase this part. See if I have this highlighting. Okay. Okay. So if you look in here, um, what this is telling us, what we are really interested in, in finding the values uh, G of M and N, uh, as we are really varying uh, K and L, how we really move across or scan through all possible values for K and L. 
Now, if you look carefully, uh, which of these two in this definition, uh, F or H will define uh, KLM? It's really F, right? Because outside a certain region of support for F, it will be equal to a zero. So it's easier to really fix F of K and M as we have done here. And then this H of M minus K and M minus L, if you remember what we did in the 1D case, we flip it, right? We flip it around the Y axis. In this case, because of the two dimensional um, situation, we flip twice, we flip around the k axis uh sorry the y axis and then around the uh, the the x axis right because this are becomes our our variables in here so negative k and another one with negative l so now this here is our h which we have it here okay uh, so there's no need to come this one okay so now um the question is um how can we control basically where we are so that's uh how we shift um, it's really determined by the M and N, right? So let's look at the first case. Um, so the first case, if M is negative and N is negative, right? That means this here, remember, this is H of M minus K and M minus L, right? So this is H, right? So now if this is, this variable here is M and N. If M and N are negative, there is no overlap between the two. Yeah, sorry about this line, should not be there. Um, so there is no overlap between this F and this shifted H or mirrored H. So basically the output G of M and N is equal to a zero when M and N are both negative. As we start to really keep shifting M and N, let's look at the next um, case. When M, is between zero and m that means this m can be between here and here right and then n same thing between n and zero or between n minus one and zero so in that case there is an overlap between the two right and that overlap remember we already start from zero so in this case this overlap in here is m plus one points and this overlap in here is n plus one point so the width is n plus one, the height is n plus one. So how many one? Remember, uh, in this example, the magnitude and the coefficient for both h and f is equal to a one. So we have n plus one times n plus one, and the values are one. Then the value for g of m and n is n plus one times n plus one. It depends where m and n is. As far as m is within this range, and n is within this range in this case. Um, we keep going, and now we have two special cases, right? Either M will go beyond M plus negative minus one, or N will go beyond N minus one, or both of them will go beyond. So the M plus M and N become in here. So let's look at these three cases one at a time. So the first case, uh, when M is still within the range, right? However, N really grew beyond just N plus minus one. So uh, the n value, small n value can be equal um, or larger than capital N. So the width in here is still variable, is a function of small m. And how many do we have? The width is n plus one. And then the width in here, the overlapping height, sorry, height is fixed. It doesn't really matter of n because n is larger than or equal to n or larger than n minus one. So in this case, what is really the height? The height we have n points, right? N samples. So now this re overlapping region here, uh, the value of this one is de determined by only the this value, small n, which is n plus one times n. Okay, and now we can go back in here and we'll grow this horizontally. So we can go to this case and now we have a fixed width, which is capital M, and the height is variable based on depending on n value, so n plus one, then the overlap in here, the region, again, these are samples, uh, only at the, at the index, at the integer indices in here. So this is just multiplication of capital M times n plus one. And in that case, this is defini defining our G of M and N, and in this case, when M is larger than or equal to capital M, and small n still within the range between zero and n minus one. 
And then finally, when we have uh, M and N goes all the way here. So M is larger than capital M and small n larger than capital N. So we have a complete overlap with the entire two-dimensional signal F in this case. So the width is fixed, M, and the height of the overlap region is fixed, capital M. So G of M and N is M times N in this case. Um, we can put all the cases together. And now we have G of M and N is zero for negative M and N. Then we have M plus one times N plus one when both M and N within that range of the dimensionality or the size of one F. And then when we have a uh, complete overlap in one direction or the other, we have these values. When we have a complete overlap, we have M times N, which is a fixed value, which is what you have in, in this. And if you plot this in a two-dimensional case, you will see uh, using a mesh, um, you will see this plot in here. Uh, so this is when you have zeros, and then this is transition in one direction, in another direction, this is n plus one times n plus one, and this is the region here when we have capital M times capital N in here. So uh, you can really do this uh, exercise simply uh, in, in DPKit or in MATLAB, um, and you can do it using the two-dimensional convolution um, uh, demo or GUI that I put on Canvas. Uh, you can find it basically uh, on Canvas. And our signal F, are both of them are lines. Um, however, uh, one of them is horizontal, which is uh, F, and the other one is vertical, which is H uh, in this case. So what is the convolution between the two? Uh, so uh, this is illustrated in here. Uh, again, um, you go back into the KNL domain space first, and then based on M and N, you start to really operate on using the definition that we have. So in this case, if you plug in everything uh, as we had before, uh, what you will have is delta of N minus L times delta of K. So that means this, um, what are the cases when uh, this will be equal to um, K, when the K equal to a zero, this will be one times when the case of n is equal to an l that we make delta of n minus l equal to a one. So if you do this, uh, the best way to look at this, just looking at the graphically. So in the KL case, I plot delta of n minus one, and then on uh, sorry delta of uh, delta of k. And the horizontal case, I have delta of n minus l. And the product between the two they will always have a single single point when they, there's a product. So the value will always be one. It doesn't matter where I shift. It doesn't matter what the value of n is. M is out of the game anyway. So this is valid for any value of m. And again, if I sh keep shifting n anywhere, uh, the product between these two lines will always be one sample. So, so the value of this output will be one. Um, so for all values of m, and, and, and this will be handy when we talk about point and line detection uh, later in the list. Uh, properties of two dimension convolution, extension of the 1D case, commutative, F convolved with H is the same as H convolved with F, associative and distributive as uh, cascade system, and so as in the homework uh, in the 1D case um, problem. Okay. Now, what I already want to spend the remaining time uh, to look at convolution when we have a separable system. Um, and uh, in this case, the first, the first uh, situation, uh, I have a general F of M and N, and then my, my, my impulse response H is separable. So I can write H of M and N as a product of two one-dimensional sequences W and V um, in this case. So now let's see if we go back to the definition of the convolution. I can call it G is equal to the sum, double summation of H, and then I have F of M minus K in minus L. And then um, I want to replace H by its definition, which is the product of two one-dimensional cases. So I haven't done really much. F is the same. The summation is the same. 
H now is W times V. So if I keep doing that, um, I want to simplify things a little bit. Now, I can take this W, K, outside the sum over the index L, as I have in here. And then what I will end up with is this expression. So this expression is what? Is a summation over L, and then I have V of L, and I have f of m minus k in minus l. So this index in here doesn't really play any game within this term. So as if I have what? <coughs> as if I have a one-dimensional convolution. So what I have in here, a one-dimensional convolution in the n direction, right? This is the same as if I'm writing the sum over L of V of L and then F of N minus L. N minus K doesn't really make a difference for us. It's a, if I'm taking, what does this mean? I'm taking every single column or, or, or yeah, column in our signal F, right? And then for every single column, I am convolving that with V, right? Now, how do I go to the next column? That's M, right? So I take the next column, I convolve that with V. So I'm having these operations column-wise, but I'm doing at every single column, I'm doing what? I'm doing a one-dimensional convolution, right, with V. So if I keep doing that, let me call that output so remember, I have the first column. This is uh, convolved with V, will give me one column in D. Next column in F, convolved with V, will give me the next column in D, and so on. So I want to name the arc from this operation, which is taking every single column in F convolved with V. I want to call the output as V. So now what do I have? You have V of M minus K and n, right? So now d is nothing but the product of the convolution of every single vector or column in f with v. So now the output, so you can think of this, I'm having this is f, I'm taking this product with h, what will be the output? I take every column in f, do it with v, next column, convolve with v, and so on. What I will get is D, right? So now the dimension of D, it will have the same number of columns as F, right? However, I'll have longer columns in D because I'm convolving F with D. And we'll look at this dimensionality in a, in a minute. So now I'm at this stage in here, I'm having D. So just look back to the equation, sum over K the W as it is, and replacing this whole thing in here with our D of M minus K and L. Again, if you look carefully at this, this is nothing but another one dimensional convolution. But now I'm looking at this in what? In over K, right? So now is M is the index. So I'm looking at this in the other direction. So I'm doing another one dimensional operator. So if you look at this operation here, this whole thing, I can have f of m and n, convolve with h, I get g. If h of m and n is a separable impulse response, is the same as taking f of m and n, take every, um, uh, is it column or, or uh, horizontal? Actually, it is, let's see. Uh, actually, every column. And convolve with v, that will give you d. Take every uh, row in D, convolve with W, will get you G. Why? Because I can write the impulse response. It happens that my impulse response in this case is the product of W times V of N. So I can really uh, replace a two-dimensional convolution with a, uh, a co two consecutive one-dimensional convolutions. And the beauty of this uh, is saving. 
So before I go to the those numbers to show you uh, the, the savings that we do, let's take it this to the next step and let's make an assumption that F is separable is S times R and the input response H is also separable, which is W times D. So now if I do that, this is the general definition of the two dimension convolution. I replace F by the product of S times R by definition, right? In this special specific case, and H is the product of W times B, right? So now if you look carefully, I take the summation over K, I take S of K, I take W of M minus K, and then the summation over L, I have R of L, P of N of L. This operation here is a one dimensional convolution. This operation here is a one dimensional convolution. So this one here is really operating on the index uh, M, and this one here is operating on the index N, right? So the output will be G1 of M times G2 of N, which means what? My output, G of M and N, is also separable. I can write G uh, of M and N as the product of two one dimensional sequences in this case. Uh, as I mentioned before, and the uh, Natural images, uh, we don't really have, um, uh, it's, it's impossible, uh, almost impossible to say, to get really a separable uh, F. Uh, question? Somebody is typing, can you mute your uh, mic? Thank you. So now to the previous example that we had, uh, you remember we had our F was equal to one within a support region controlled by capital M minus one and N capital N minus one. And then we have the unit sample function U of M and N as our operator. If you think about it, our uh, both of them, F and H, both of these are really uh, separable. And in that case, instead of really doing this whole operation that we had done before, you can simply basically uh, do it in uh, two, one dimensional convolution, and that will give you G1 and G2. Product between G1 and G2 uh, will give you G of M and N. And you can really try it in, uh, in uh, not even by hand, you can try it just in, in MATLAB or in, in Python. Um, so all of this, why? Uh, to, for this uh, computational savings. So let's assume in the general case, usually if our, um, Tegnal F has a dimension, just assume it's a square, capital N times capital N, and then H, our operator, our impulse response, is M times N. And in, in general, our operator is smaller, much smaller than our image size. So capital M is much less than capital N as we have noticed. So if none of them is reciprocal, what do we have? The output, which is the convolution between F and H, what is the dimension? Remember what's the dimension? If you have F of N, dimension of this one is uh, N, and you have H of N in the one key, in the one D case, this is M, then the output G, which is the convolution between F and H, will be M plus N minus one, right? So the same thing in a two dimensional case, F convolved with H, where the input is F squared M by N, and then H is another square M by M, then the output will be, which is G, will be of this size, n plus n minus one times n plus n minus one. So that's the first thing. Now, every single point, so this in here, is our G of m and n. Our G dimension is this, right? Every single point that we have in here is obtained using how many multiplication? M by N multiplication because of this multiplication, right? So now what do we have? We have N plus N minus one square is obtained. Is every single point equals M square. That will give us roughly, if you do just the math, because the fact that capital M is much smaller than capital N, we have N square uh, M, uh, M squared. So now if you replace that with uh, when H is separable, we can reduce that to n, n square m. Um, 
And then we have an example that we'll go through at the very beginning of next uh, lecture. Any question before? Uh, so what we started today is just an introduction to an extension from the 1D case to two-dimensional case. Uh, we look at uh, some examples of uh, uh, two-dimensional signals. We look at the systems, the extension from the 1D linear time invariant system to linear shift invariant systems, which is a spatial domain, but the same concept. And we look at the convolution in two-dimensional case. And uh, next time we'll look at the finite extension and then we'll look at the frequency uh, response uh, definition um, before we move into sampling. Uh, uh, any question? Okay, thank you guys. Um, have a good weekend. Uh, Yes, there is a question on the chat. It says the homework is due at 5 p.m. tomorrow Eastern time. Yes, uh, that's uh, that's for all sections except the section Q. Uh, section Q will have it due on Monday. That's why uh, our TA Roman he will share the solution after 5 p.m. on Monday. But it's due for the section A, Q3, and Chenjin. Uh, it will be due uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Yes. Hi, Professor. I have one quick question for you. Yes, sir. Um, uh, in the homework, uh, it's mentioned to download PyCharm. I couldn't find anywhere that PyCharm was specifically needed. Is there a reason for PyCharm over whatever IDE? No, I mean, you can use any other one. It's fine. It just This is how we set it up, but you can use any other one. It's fine. Yes. I started to work for you. And, and I just have one question on the... On the um, the final project. Um, yes. Just because you mentioned earlier, uh, um, I don't know if it was if it was mentioned in the syllabus, but is, are the only final projects to improve uh, written papers, or can we come up with something that we want to do with image processing and and work on that? I was waiting for someone to ask the question. So uh, by default, what I will be doing, uh, there are five or six topics in the syllabus. I will be assigning one or two papers for each topic, most likely one paper each. And then I will ask undergraduate students to reproduce the results in a certain aspect in the paper, not necessarily everything in the paper. For example, uh, I already have a paper uh, and I will ask undergraduate students to apply the same concept because the code is already in GitHub uh, to a new data set. Um, so uh, this for undergrad. For the graduate students, um, basically, uh, they will have this, they will pick one of these papers and they're one of these topics, and then they will say, uh, we really work on this to achieve a better, a better performance, better results, uh, right? So, so now, if you already have a specific idea and they're one of these topics, what I advise you to do is, that's why we have a proposal, um, to look at the paper I'm assigning, look at your idea, and if there is a way you can really bring them together where your idea can improve on top of this paper, that's fantastic. Uh, if, if, if it's completely different, but it's still under the same topic like recognition or, or quality assessment, but it's very different from the paper I'm assigning, but you are doing research in that um, in the idea that you have, uh, or, or there's some other reason because you have worked on it before, you already have some, some, some really, really exciting things or ideas about it, then that will be the proposal to say, I have this and it's the reasons uh, I, I may not be able to compete on this paper, uh, and here are here is my idea, uh, and, and that that's when I I will look uh, I and Norman will look at the proposal and we'll get back to you with some some uh, some uh, some some feedback. Uh, does this make sense? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hey, hey Professor, did you want to leave, or could I ask a question? If you want to leave, that's fine. No, no, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, so I, I, I have time. Okay, two quick questions. Um, the first one is, I I can only find this course for uh, image processing. Are is this the only doubly course for image processing? And and are if we wanted to do research, PhD research, are you pretty much the only advisor available for image processing? <laughs> so the question, are you stuck with me? Okay. Yeah, uh, no, no, it's not. <laughs> I just I just want to make sure. <laughs> no, no, I, the light. So, yeah. So, so uh, yes, this is the only course in image processing, and that's why. 
this is the first time we really extended this to be undergraduate. Uh, there are some other professors who do some aspect of image processing uh, other than me. For example, um, Chris Barnes, uh, he does more in the SAR um, kind of things. Uh, Chris Rosell, he uh, years back, he did more into the hyperspectral imaging uh, side of things. Um, so there are others who, like uh, Linda Willis, for example, she did really uh, more of a video and image processing on embedded systems, uh, for example. Uh, there are some other faculty who do more on the imaging side of things, uh, uh, how to create these images and acquisition. Um, so uh, it, it depends on what kind of uh, uh, topic. I, I am more into kind of the processing and analytics side of it. Uh, uh, as I mentioned early on, um, I'm, 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 I'm not doing imaging per se. I'm doing more on the processing side of, of things. Uh, okay. But if you have specific questions, then I can... I can kind of share with you by email or by PADS a message, or some other email address of other faculty members that okay. may of interest to you. Uh, just, just let me know. Okay, thanks. And then the second uh, quick question was for uh, num number five B. It says, what pri are the primaries associated with RGB components, respectively? Does no uh, problem set? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I guess I was confused about how primaries was being used here. Yeah, so primary, basically, uh, in, in our definition, uh, let's see, what are the primaries associated with that? Yes, so when you have a primary like an R, that means R is equal to a 1, and then the, 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 there is no other component for B and G, right? So that's one primary, right? When R is equal to a 1, and B and G equal to a 0. Another one when R is 0 and B is 0, but G is 1, and so on. So these are okay. the primaries uh, in, in that for R and G and D in this definition. Okay, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, Professor, there's a question in the chat about um, one of the problems asking us to write some code in part. <coughs> if you just yes. Oh, yeah, so um, in the PDF, um, you can just take a screenshot or just copy and paste the code. Uh, all what we just want to see, um, we, we really just want to see the results, uh, more or less, but you kind of have the codes there just to kind of say that you did the, code, the, the work. Later on in the semester, we'll have more problem sets where the code can be a little bit longer. Um, you can put it in the appendix, uh, but mostly what the TA will be teaching, unless we specifically ask you for the code, uh, we are looking at the figures, the results, the resulting image. Uh, so the, those are the things we will be looking for. Uh, uh, if you want to add the code in an appendix, uh, they are more than welcome. Screenshot or copy and paste is fine, but we will not really grade the code uh, uh, unless we ask to you for the code. Uh, then we grade the code. Does this make sense? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, have a good weekend, everyone, and uh, we'll see you. I mean, <laughs> we'll be real uh, on li live next Tuesday. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, bye.